The philosophy of science is important because science is one of the best methods we have for finding out the truth. It's not the only method, but it's a very good one. We all want to know the truth about how the world works, but how do we know the truth? For most of history, for most people, truth was common sense or whatever a trusted figure, the chief, the rabbi, the priest, the medicine man, the elderly, whoever, said it was. More recently, after people started thinking about philosophy, there were some philosophers who debated how it is that we know things. How do we know what is true and what is not? There are many people who have thought about this, and this is a big part of any introductory philosophy class, but one of the most influential ideas comes from the philosopher Plato and involves his allegory of the cave. Plato's allegory of the cave goes as follows. Imagine that there is a man trapped in a cave, and he faces the back of the cave so he can only see the shadows of people when they pass by the entrance. If that's his entire experience, then his version of reality is incomplete and flawed. He doesn't know what real people look like because all he sees are their shadows. His ability to know the truth is compromised by his limited experience. Plato then argued that we're all essentially trapped in an experiential cave when it comes to thinking about nature and reality. We live short little lives with a limited ability to see the world, so we end up with a superficial and flawed understanding of it. In Plato's metaphor, only God is able to know true reality. In Plato's view, the true reality consists of what are now known as platonic ideals or platonic molds, genuine things that God understands but we can only guess at. For example, he would have argued that there is a metaphysical thing called dog, but our understanding of it is based on the shadowy representations of dog that we see. That is to say, the dogs we see around us. He would argue that we cannot understand what a true dog is because all we see is the shadows. We can try to make guesses, perhaps, by studying dogs, but we will always lack a true understanding. This may seem like a crazy idea, and may even remind you of the movie The Matrix, but when combined with the religious beliefs and an acceptance of the supernatural, this metaphor really did influence the way people thought for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's just one example of philosophers trying to describe how we can attempt to know what is real. Since Plato's time, we have developed other approaches that are not quite as pessimistic. One of these is the idea that there can be a scientific method that we can use that allows us to determine what is true and what is not. Before we get into the details of what makes an approach to finding the truth scientific or not, let's contrast this with an alternative approach which is one based on personal faith. These are two very different ways of deciding what is true, and neither is perfect for all circumstances. Each has their own pros and cons. First, the cons of using a scientific approach or using a faith-based approach. The main problem for using a scientific method is that it is limited in the scope of what it can address. It is limited to things that can be concretely measured. Also, following from this, the scientific method will not be able to make moral decisions. The scientific method is amoral, without morals. Note that this is different from immoral, which means with bad morals. The scientific method will not be able to say whether something is good or bad, right or wrong. It may be able to tell us what most people think is right or wrong, but it cannot actually make that decision itself. The main problem for using personal faith is that there is no accepted way to change a faith-based belief once the truth is known. This leads to the main problem of personal faith as a way of knowing things. There is no conflict resolution procedure for the situation when two people have different beliefs in what is true that are based on differing personal faiths. This doesn't mean that a faith-based belief is wrong, it's just that if two people have different faith-based beliefs, there's no mechanism to resolve that disagreement in a way that both parties will accept. This limitation severely limits the utility of faith for reaching a common agreement on what the truth is. Now the pros of using the scientific or faith-based approaches. The best feature of the scientific method is that it does have a method for conflict resolution. Not quite as clear as deciding the winner in a boxing match, but there is an agreed method that will allow two parties that have different scientific beliefs to come to some sort of resolution. This will allow one person to accept that the other's argument is more accurate and thereby change their mind to better determine the truth. This allows a field that uses the scientific method to resolve disagreements and to move forward to resolving the next disagreement or posing the next question. The scientific method allows for a progressive approach to discovering more and more about reality instead of having endless, unresolvable debates. The best feature of personal faith is that it can address the non-measurable phenomena that the scientific method cannot. Personal faith can be used for moral or subjective decisions. This is particularly useful for talking about whether things are good or bad, right or wrong, things that virtually everybody accepts as real and genuine, but science cannot directly measure. To summarize, 
It basically comes down to science being able to make statements about measurable things so that disagreements can be resolved, whereas faith can make statements about immeasurable things but lacks a true method to allow people to resolve any disagreements they may have. Before we continue, I'd like to discuss something that isn't exactly the philosophy of science, but is related to thinking about how we interpret information about nature. It's useful to keep in mind that natural is not always the same thing as good. Science can reveal many things about nature and tell us what is or is not, but we should always keep in mind that science cannot be used to argue for what is good or bad. For example, the meme pictured here shows sea otters being extremely cute and holding hands while they sleep, so it makes it seem like sea otters are good creatures. However, scientific studies have shown that male sea otters assault seals because that is how the mating behavior of otters works. Female otters have evolved to be able to resist this attention by males, whereas seals have not. In fact, as the scientific paper cited on the screen shows, assaults from sea otters are a major source of mortality for seals. Based on this, it would seem that sea otters are bad instead of good. The flaw in trying to use scientific information to talk about whether otters are good or bad is that while it can tell us that otters sleep while holding hands and that otters assault seals, that is all it tells us. It tells us what otters do, it does not tell us whether what otters do is good or bad. I mention this because many people will often try to invoke science to make moral pronouncements, and that is almost always a flawed approach. So, what is it that makes something scientific? What is a scientific theory anyway? There are two conditions for a hypothesis or theory to be considered scientific. First, the theory must be capable of being used to make predictions. We require this because otherwise the theory is useless. Furthermore, these predictions must be new predictions that haven't already been tested and for which we already know the answers. If we didn't have this requirement, then any proposed theory could be too ad hoc, that is to say, it's just an explanation full of special cases and may only hold for the situations that we already know everything about. Second, the predictions that our theory makes must be falsifiable by some conceivable observation. In other words, when we make our predictions, they have to make predictions about things we can measure so that we can go and measure them and see if the prediction is correct. We require this falsifiability in order to resolve conflicts, and it's the core of what makes the scientific method so useful. To resolve a conflict between two different scientific theories or hypotheses, we just need to identify a prediction where the two hypotheses or ideas differ from each other and perform some sort of experiment or take an observation to measure reality. Then we can see which of the two predictions is correct. That will tell us which of the two hypotheses is correct or more strongly supported. This procedure can be used over and over to test a variety of different ideas, and it's how science works. Before we get into more details, a cautionary note about how the terms theory and hypothesis are used when we're talking about science. The word theory is used differently in the philosophy of science than it is in everyday language. In the philosophy of science, the word theory means a well-established set of observations and the explanations for them. For example, the theory of gravity, the germ theory of disease, the theory of evolution, etc. are called theories because they are well-established sets of observations and explanations for how gravity works or how bacteria and viruses cause disease or how organisms change over time. In everyday language, the word theory is often used more or less like idea. In the philosophy of science, we use the word hypothesis when we're talking about single ideas. A hypothesis is an idea that makes a prediction about a specific situation. The way in which the word theory is used differently in science and in popular culture is a source of considerable confusion. It's also used by dishonest people to criticize scientific theories they don't like by calling them theories and hoping that the audience will assume that means they're just ideas rather than the well-established sets of observations and explanations that they really are. Okay, so how does science work in practice? Science works in the following way. Starting at the top left of this diagram, we have some sort of scientific theory that we're seeking to add to. We therefore have some sort of observation or question in mind. Of course, these are motivated by the theory that we're working with. That observation or question leads to a hypothesis or idea about what may or may not be true for some specific situation. We use that hypothesis in order to make a concrete prediction and then design some sort of experiment or observation to test whether what we predict is what we see in nature. When we test this prediction, it could be that the prediction turns out to be incorrect. When that happens, the hypothesis was wrong, and because it was based on our theory, this would then weaken the theory and cause us to have less confidence in it. On the other hand, if the prediction is correct, that means our hypothesis was true, and because it came from our theory, that strengthens the theory. Note that a single prediction isn't used to make or break a theory. 
For incorrect predictions, we may have missed something when we did our observation or not understood a more complex natural system that didn't fit some of the assumptions we made when using our theory. When an idea makes a correct prediction, we don't over-extrapolate and assume we've figured everything out because we may have just gotten lucky once. Theories are built from the totality of a series of many, many hypotheses and tested predictions. The process of science is essentially a series of loops where we have an initial idea we use to make predictions, and if it keeps making correct predictions, that idea becomes strengthened, and after a while, and enough correct predictions, our idea or hypothesis can mature to become a theory. Sometimes, ideas that seem perfectly legitimate are used to make predictions, but if the predictions keep on being incorrect, then that idea that we had never truly develops into a scientific theory. It ends up being discarded, like some old famous ideas from the history of science like ether or the geocentric solar system. Technically, in the philosophy of science, we never really prove anything. We just have theories that are built upon a large number of observations and that provide a large number of correct explanations that we accept as being true and accurate. They last until someone comes along and starts using that theory to make a bunch of incorrect predictions. The burden of evidence to get a theory initially in place is high, and lies on the people developing it. But once a mature theory is in place, the burden of evidence would then shift to the detractors to show how it makes multiple incorrect predictions. The use of concrete predictions and possibility for falsifiability are fundamental to the process of how science develops its theories. These fairly strict requirements are what make something scientific and provide the real advantage of scientific theories, the ability to resolve conflicts when there are competing ideas or theories. To test them against one another, you test their predictions. Despite all the benefits of science, however, it is not perfect. The scientific approach does have weaknesses. First up, when does life begin? This is a major question for people who think about abortion or prenatal healthcare. There are a number of different points at which people have argued that life begins. For example, maybe life begins at conception when the sperm meets the egg. That definition is unambiguous, but it's not very pragmatic because there is no way to detect that event with medical technology. The definition is also logically flawed when we think about non-human biology. We don't use conception as our hard and fast definition for when other living things start their lives. All male bees are the result of an unfertilized egg laid by the queen, for example. They are alive but without conception. A second definition would be when the fertilized zygote implants in the uterus. This is also an unambiguous definition, and it's more pragmatic, because that event can be detected by a pregnancy test, but it still has issues of its own. This occurs quite early in development, and sometimes implantations can start and then fail, leading to the loss of that entity. We can think about how impractical these first two definitions are based on the fact that so many fertilized embryos never implant or have failed implantations and are lost with vaginal discharge. If they occur early enough, these events would seem no different from a normal period. If we really wanted to be consistent with our use of these definitions, women should collect all their fluids that may contain a fertilized egg and send them to a lab for testing to see if they contain the remains of an unimplanted living person. The fact that even the most ardent anti-abortion individuals don't do this speaks to the impracticality of these definitions. Two other definitions that sometimes receive lots of attention are when the heartbeat begins and when fingers develop. While these may have emotional importance, they are essentially arbitrary points during the development of a fetus. We certainly don't require people to have fingers to be considered alive after they're born, for example. Some people use viability outside the womb as a standard for when life begins, but that definition is logically indefensible because it depends on geography, wealth, and technology, which may change over time. You would think that life should not vary depending on those things. Finally, birth can be considered an unambiguous point at which life begins, but most people would consider the entity within the mother to be alive just prior to that specific event. Causing the death of that entity just minutes before birth would be immoral to most people, so waiting all the way until birth to consider the fetus alive would not be considered moral by most people. The real problem with this entire debate is that the relevant definition of life is not objective. By that, I mean the definition that people concerned about abortion are thinking about is one that confers the rights and moral responsibilities that are equal to those associated with a child or an adult. The definition that science uses, because it does not address rights or moral responsibilities, is restricted to anatomy or physiological processes. These two definitions of life are not the same. The scientific definition of life, while providing potentially useful information, cannot be used to truly answer the moral question of what is alive in the sense needed to resolve the abortion debate. 
And so that debate remains unresolved because a fundamental aspect of it is based on personal faith. A second large and important question asks what are the best gun control laws for a country? There is certainly plenty of measurable evidence that more limits on gun ownership would reduce gun violence. For example, the data figure shows the relationship between gun deaths per 100,000 in each state and the rate of gun ownership in each state. The citations for the data are in the description below. There seems to be a relationship between these two factors. To better see it, let's remove the obvious outlier because it's Maryland, which has skewed statistics because almost half the state's population lives in Baltimore, a city with a very high crime rate and is not directly comparable to the other states. Now we can more clearly see that there is a clear relationship between gun ownership and gun deaths. The states with the highest gun ownership have gun death rates four times higher than the lowest ones. It seems clear that reducing gun ownership would reduce gun death. However, more limits to gun ownership would reduce personal freedom, and everyone values personal freedom to some degree. The problem for a scientific approach to designing gun control laws is that freedom is not a measurable quantity. In the US, we place value on people's freedom to act as they wish, and certain aspects of freedom, such as gun ownership or religion, are so valued that they are given extra constitutional protections. But again, what numbers can we put on these freedoms? We can't, not really. It's therefore impossible to create some sort of equation to balance changing freedom against changing the number of gun deaths. Again, data collection and scientific methods can provide information for this debate, but the scientific approach alone cannot resolve it because the value of freedom is going to be based on personal faith. Of course, the personal faith approach has its weaknesses too. For example, how would we decide which football team is the best? The obvious answer is the Green Bay Packers. In fact, I could even try to use data to demonstrate this. The Packers have the most NFL championships in history, they've had three of the best quarterbacks in the history of the NFL, and they've had arguably the best wide receiver in the history of the NFL as well. No matter how great you think Jerry Rice was, he didn't kick 172 extra points, make 30 interceptions, and catch over 100 touchdowns while playing the game when people hardly ever pass the ball. Not only this, they're the only team that is owned by their own fans instead of by one or more multimillionaires. Based on all this, it's very clear that the Packers are the best team. But of course, that doesn't really answer this question because is data what we use to decide which team we support? If you have a favorite team, your answer probably differs. Each person's choice is usually based on where they grew up or which team happened to be having the most success when they first started paying attention to football choice of which football team is the best is going to be based on personal faith instead of data. For football, the lack of a resolution mechanism isn't a bad thing. It's what allows fans to have endless, unresolvable, entertaining debates about which team is the best. But if truly answering this question in a way that everyone could agree on was important, we wouldn't be able to do it. Or to consider a more important question, which religion is correct? To simplify things, we could contrast Christianity and Islam. These faiths differ in several things, but let's focus on two. First, who or what was Jesus? In Christianity, Jesus was the Son of God, whereas in Islam, Jesus was a great prophet, but not divine. Second, what is the nature of God? In Christianity, God is understood to be a trinity of entities, but also a unity, whereas in Islam, God is understood to be only a unity, and the idea of a trinity is considered polytheistic and incorrect. Of course, any Christian would respond by saying that that interpretation of the trinity misses the real point of the unity of God. But the real point here is not any of these details, it's in the fact that there is no data or measurable thing that could be used to resolve these disagreements. Is unambiguous data what we use to decide on the nature of God? For example, I have a former student who saw a snake in her backyard and made eye contact. In that moment, she experienced Shiva. Can that be measured? Can she be convinced that her personal experience with her god is untrue because it wasn't measured by some machine? Of course not. Religious beliefs are based on faith. They do not come from using a scientific approach to deciding about the existence and nature of God. There is no experiment that could be performed that would generate data that would convince a member of a religion to switch religion or abandon their religion. That does not mean that these beliefs are not true, but it does mean that these beliefs lack an agreed-upon resolution mechanism. This is the main reason why there is such contentious debate and disagreement about religion, and why there always will be. Despite their weaknesses, both scientific approaches and faith-based approaches are used to discover the truth. This is even acknowledged by the most faith-based people around. 
This quote from Pope John Paul II illustrates this nicely. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. Not that one is right and one is wrong, both are important. So how should we approach finding out the truth? This simple diagram can go a long way towards that end. If we're trying to figure out what is and is not in the material, natural world, then science is the most useful approach. If we're trying to make decisions about things outside of the natural world or make moral conclusions, then religion and philosophy are the most useful approaches. We run into problems when we try to use the wrong approach for the goal at hand. Since this video is on a channel associated with evolutionary biology, we'll end by relating these topics to the study of evolution. This tension between using the scientific approach and a faith-based approach is at the heart of apparent disagreements about evolution. I say apparent because the disagreements are only present outside of the scientific community. Evolution is a field of science and has its history like all sciences. In the 1800s, there was a scientific debate between two differing hypotheses about biological diversity. There was a historical scientific debate between evolution and creationism. Intelligent and qualified professionals made arguments on both sides, but the measurable evidence that tested predictions kept confirming the predictions of the evolutionary hypothesis and it eventually became an evolutionary theory. Creationism did not experience the same success with its predictions. In fact, in general, it struggles to make testable predictions at all. By the end of the 1800s, creationism therefore ended up joining old discarded scientific ideas like phlogiston, the emission theory of vision, the geocentric universe, the flat earth theory, phrenology, etc. Those were a whole bunch of other ideas that seemed reasonable at the time, but didn't match up with experiments and observations. Now, today, creationism is no longer a scientific hypothesis and not accepted or studied within the scientific community. That doesn't mean that it's false, but it is certainly not scientific anymore. Creationism is now a faith-based belief. When we do biology now, we use evolution instead of creationism because that's the falsifiable theory that gave us testable predictions that have withstood over a hundred years of challenges. These correct predictions can then be used to make new hypotheses and more testable predictions to help us discover the details about why life is the way it is. Feel free to like, subscribe, comment, and all the usual YouTube things. Also, check out the Evolution Examples website, where there are links to a bunch of other videos and resources about evolutionary biology. The website also has an array of cartoon animals and social media accounts so you can stay in contact. 